No, we still have five minutes. So, so, we didn't do it. anything yet. <laughs> no, this room, this room is quick. So, you know how to switch it over. What's that
She's on prednisone now. I'm doing okay. But I'm cheap. So, so, one dose. Let's see how it is. Usually, self to cell is in That's what I'm going to use next. That was actually in your notes when I had them send them to me. That that was going to be your next choice. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you know, the other one I could use my gaps on. I used to use that too, and that worked pretty well. But then I had two people in a row with it from Mediterranean. I blew up their red cells. Okay, this isn't a good sign. Sunny side? Rose Born. What? Mike, did you swipe that paper from the desk coming in? Yeah. No, no, I came like you brought your own paper. Yeah. <laughs> Tuesday, New York Times always has good science, you know, science section. You never talk any of President Reagan. You know when he was elected president? You know how old he was? Oh, seventy something. Sixty-nine. When he became president. We're analyzing the speech patterns to show that he was really having dementia before. There's a new speech method that they compared him and Bush's speech patterns. So they wow. And they say, yeah, back. So what they do with pretty white blood is really signs of dementia. <laughs> yeah, she, she came back with us last night. She sort of came to the fourth year. She matched your uh, UW oh, she did. internal medicine. Good. Oh, all right. Yeah. Does that mean she gets to do Durham here too? Or? No, that's, that's a separate oh, matter. Oh, yeah. Well, that's an issue. She's got oh. internal medicine here. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Tonight, I mean, she yeah. probably could switch to the full internal medicine yeah. residency, although she's really just in the one The preliminary. Yeah. And then oh, that's great. the trim oh, part is still getting the Durham yeah. 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 safer than I might be on the streets in the cities of the USA. Um, so uh, I forget the original title I gave Harry. It was more creative than this one. <laughs> uh, Viticulture, uh, Enology, and How to Love Two Buck Chuck, I think, would be a good title. So I'll let him get started in just a minute, but I've been carrying this around for some time here. Those of you who know he's a world-class wino, and... Uh, beyond enjoying and making wine, he also collects glasses from wineries all around the world. So I think this is a winery you probably haven't been to, the Golan Heights Winery. <laughs> the Golan Heights. I sent him a picture. I was standing right at the Israeli-Syrian border looking down into Syria. Um, but I brought this back oh, to very you. Very nice. I appreciate it. Uh, make its way without getting broken. There's no bullet holes in it. All right. So, go ahead, Gary. All right. Uh, Len is right. He gave me the uh, title again: of Viticulture and Enology, or Why uh, Two Buck Chuck. The uh, bottom line is, I'm going to upscale this talk a bit from his recommendation. In fact, this could be the most important uh, medical lecture you've heard in the last 10 years. Because so, I'm going to talk about wine and health, something that you usually don't talk about much in medical school or in residency, but is an everyday issue. And I'm going to show you what I think is surprising data. I never really reviewed this before. First of all, the usual disclosure side. I, I have no financial affiliations anymore with drug companies, but I am a member of San Michelle Winery. Primarily, get early tickets for concerts. By the way, Chicago's going to be there, and I got tickets already. And John Fogarty, so if anybody wants to join me, uh, come along. I'm a member of the FST Wine Club as well. 
I also make my own home wine, and I confess to being a moderate wine drinker, so I'm somewhat biased about this talk. I kind of like to make uh, vice into a virtue. What's the definition of moderate? <laughs> you took the gun, but I, I do have a slide on that, and, and I will talk about it, and that is an important concept, okay? Now, uh, this is mainly for the fellows to make sure that they pay attention, because there'll be a quiz on this, and this could be on your boards here. <laughs> Anyhow, this is the best match, the left side matching with the right. To be honest with you, I think this is a hard quiz, and if you guys could uh, answer most of them before this, you've been drinking too much. This, the next matching is a little bit easier, because you can kind of guess it sometimes by the names, but you know, which grape, which region, uh, most of these in Europe, but also in California. So pay attention. Now, what I did is I went to uh, the literature to see, are there any benefits of moderate alcohol consumption? And I would have assumed that the literature would have looked at all the bad things that would happen with alcohol consumption. And I, I would guess that they were surprised to find all the very good things that can happen as long as it's in moderation. First of all, if you drink in moderation, and I'll talk about it's usually one uh, drink a day for women and two for men. Uh, and then if you're in Europe, it's four to six drinks a day. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, you live longer. The all-cause death has decreased approximately 25%. And one study showed it had two years uh, extra life. You have fewer hospitalizations. You're less likely to need nursing home care. You have less disability you require less long-term health care. You have higher life satisfaction based on primarily health issues. You have less psychological stress and there's diminished depression for those who drink moderately. You miss work less. Dementia has decreased in one prospective study suggested it decreased by 75%. You have better uh, physical function and activity of daily living. Your memory is better and your cognitive function is better overall. I think all of you are aware about the one issue that's been well publicized. You have reduced heart disease about 50%. Uh, most of this has to do with coronary artery disease. And, and, and they explain some of the physiology with studies that you have better arterial elasticity, slower pulse rates, less coronary calcification, better endothelial function, you have lower CRP levels, and you have fewer cardiac risk factors. You even have less congestive heart failure. Now, it's all well known by all of you that it increases your HDLs, decreases your LDLs, and it also has other effects on coagulation by decreasing platelet aggregation. It also lowers your blood pressure. People that drink uh, in moderation have fewer uh, ischemic strokes and they have a uh, lower risk of having so-called metabolic syndrome. I was surprised that moderate drinking even trumps regular exercise in regards to decreasing your cardiac risk. You have increased bone density, especially in postmenopausal women. You are less likely to have hip, hip, hip fractures. You have increased femoral neck bone density. Now, in regards to gallstone-related disease, for both men and women, it's decreased. It also decreased a lot of different cancers, including kidney, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, Hodgkin's lymphoma. You do have fewer colonic polyps. You have less risk of thyroid cancer. Studies have even shown you're more resistant to cold viruses when they're going around the community. You also have less uh, peripheral arterial disease, and not surprising, as a result, you have less intermittent claudication. There's also evidence of benefit in essential tremor. It decreases the risk of catching hepatitis A. It decreases the uh, macular degeneration, decreases your risk of pancreatic cancer. Also decreases your risk of Parkinson's disease and probably therapeutic while you're drinking for it at any rate. It also, the so-called frailty syndrome, a kind of a new concept I hadn't heard of, uh, just basically the kind of dwindles of old people, it decreases that risk, and it decreases the risk of atrophic gastritis. Just a quick summary. Alcohol, in moderation, appears to have more benefit in heart disease than diet, lowering cholesterol, <clears throat> treating hypertension, or even exercise, as I said. Only smoking cessation has a greater impact. 
And one of the, a couple of papers came out that said that alcohol prevents more deaths than its abuse causes, which I, I thought was pretty amazing. Now, I got this like a prescription on a glass of wine, which I thought was very cute. But at any rate, do you say, well, gosh, if this is so good for you and we don't have anything else that seems to be as good that we recommend for patients, the only thing that probably trumps this is your genetics. You say, well, why can't we recommend this to everybody? And the obvious answer is because you can drink too much. And so how do you keep somebody drinking moderation? Now, it's interesting, just this last week, uh, there was a, on 26th, there was an article in the uh, Seattle Times about uh, one of the things that you know, increased alcohol intake can increase, and that's the risk of liver cancer. And it, but it's three drinks a day, remember moderation is two, so two is still okay. And for uh, women, if you're drink, drinking just one, you have to drink three more, uh, or two more to get the risk. But this is what I also like, though, you know, trying to make uh, uh, vice into virtue, coffee can cut that risk. So if you drink coffee and you drink three drinks, you can offset that risk. Now, here's a picture of uh, some examples of moderate consumers of alcohol. It's actually a question mark because this is tailgating for Husky games. And I will admit, those days, uh, moderation is not in effect. In effect, there's Drew and Sarah and Wendy and a bunch of Drew's high school buddies. Just a point I want to make here. They're drinking beer. You get the same benefits. It's alcohol. It's not the wine, per se. Okay? The other reason we drink a little bit more heavily at Husky Games is our team hasn't been very good the last few years. <laughs> so anyway, when you define moderation, maybe that's just... Here is the slide. Yep, the this is what uh, Len was asking about. The health benefits, again, of moderate consumption is, is what is moderation. And these, it's outlined here for beer, 12 ounce beer. Uh, and again, it's one drink a day for women. You know, men get two of these. One and a half ounces of hard liquor and five ounces of wine. As I just pointed out, there's really little difference between uh, red wine and white wine versus other sources of alcohol. You know, they've tried to push that the uh, antioxidant effects of resveratrol are important. And, and in vitro studies, the antioxidants are great. But the truth of the matter, in, vi in vivo, there's little evidence that antioxidants make uh, much difference. You know, I, I kind of went to look this up a little bit more, and I went to a summary of, uh, of studies of antioxidant supplements, which are extremely popular in this country. And the summary of the studies by the Harvard School of Public Health said, and this is a quote, the studies so far are inconclusive, but generally don't provide strong evidence that antioxidants have substantial impact on disease or any stress on any disease. Even though the people want to keep uh, getting their antioxidants in every advertisement with the vitamins, oh, it's an antioxidant, et cetera. This is also the case with resveratrol. There's really no evidence that there's anything magical about that, but you can buy it at the health food stores. It's estimated $60 billion a year is spent on supplements, and much of it is due to this antioxidant uh, hype. Now, I do think that it's probably not all just alcohol that's good for you. I think that the, there's a lifestyle of wine drinkers, at least, that I think uh, predisposes to better health. You know, I, they tend to eat better diets, uh, if people that are uh, uh, moderate wine drinkers. And you remember the French paradox that the French uh, eat lots of saturated fats and drink alcohol, but they had a lower risk of coronary artery disease, and what was it? <laughs> and, and, and it was supposed to be the diet, and, and, and some of this has to do uh, with the, the people that drink wine tend to eat somewhat like French with more fruits and vegetables, <clears throat> uh, have less uh, cholesterol and, uh, and saturated fats, although the French paradox, they have lots of saturated fats. Less red meat, more fowl and fish. People that drink in moderation have a higher IQ and have a higher level of education. In other words, drinking makes you smart, it looks like. They have a higher socioeconomic status. You're also more likely to exercise and less likely to smoke. So I, I'm sure that has something to do, at least with wine drinkers in, in moderation, having a decreased risk of all those uh, uh, issues about uh, cancer, uh, strokes, coronary artery disease, etc. So Gary, back to all the health effects that you ran through. You didn't show us native slides, but I... Here is the data. I'll tell you the reason why that. Well, how they take all those other confounders out and know really just alcohol right. 
and not other lifestyle issues are the reason for the health of that. I mean, I you know, know, it is. It's almost impossible. Uh, obviously, these are all, for the most part, observational studies, but that's what you have to rely on on things like this. But I think that uh, what is impressive is the aggregate of the number of studies. I, I do have references here for anybody who wants it. It's uh, like 20, 30 pages. There are thousands of studies on this of millions of people. So it does look like there's something to it. So anyhow, uh, I've got this if anybody cares, all right? Now I'm gonna get to what Len uh, wanted me to talk about and, and talking about the process of making wine. And I will admit I am a dilettante winemaker. I make very few of the decisions. I just do what I'm told. But guess what? A lot of times, wine turns out pretty good. <laughs> but and, but at least I have some familiarity with it. Uh, Frank, you ever make wine? Not anymore. So you did. Yeah. Uh, uh, Frank has a very sophisticated palate. He yeah. probably wouldn't drink what our uh, home wine winemakers uh, drink. He's used to well, see you creek. Yeah, 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 might tell so, him for the young people, the fellows here. Wine making and even owning vineyards has been part of the allergy yeah. tradition here, back to Dr. Bierman and Pearson and Shapiro, all of who are deceased, but they owned uh, vineyards. Uh, started which vineyard did they? Which winery did they start? Well, Associated Vintners was the like UW sort of professor club. That's, and that's right. Right. It started out with a bunch of university professors deciding to make wine. And about half of them got serious about it, and, and just like he said, they uh, started Associated Vintners, which eventually became Columbia Winery. Yeah. But the other half did it just for fun, and a bunch of the allergists were in it, and Rick and uh, Johnson, Jim Strove were in it, and, and Stan Sam Zikes, of course, and he's still a very active. In fact, we still press the grapes at his house. So. And so yeah, it still is a bunch of allergies. Like one generation older than me. Yeah. <laughs> that be. Yeah. So anyhow, so uh, there are a lot of allergists that are moderate wine drinkers. You right, so that drink too much. But we won't mention names here. <laughs> All right, the vineyard. You, well, in growing grapes, that's where the whole process of winemaking starts. And you start with the grape vines. The major grape vine for good wine is Vitas nifera, which is from Europe. Again, it makes the best wine, lives about 60 to 100 years. Now, Vitas Labrusco, which is uh, uh, Eastern North American uh, grape, got into the history kind of indirectly, but it's very important. It makes uh, the grapes that aren't very good for winemaking, but it has hardier roots and is resistant to a louse called Phylloxera vastatrix. And it's interesting it both caused the problem and solved the problem because people took some of these Labrusca uh, vines, took them over to Europe, but it brought the louse with them and it killed off like 80% of the grapes in, in Europe. And so that it was a disaster. They said, like, what are we going to do? We, our grapevines are all uh, being uh, eaten up by this louse. Well, they, they learned to splice it onto the rootstock of the phylo, uh, phylloxera, uh, I mean, of the... Of the uh, Vetus labrusca. So they'd use that as the root and then they splice the Vetus vinifera plant for the upper part for growing the grapes and it worked great. So that salvaged the European wine industry. And they still use rootstocks through most of the uh, world now. It's my understanding that the state of Washington doesn't have much phylox or abacid trick, so they actually do use Vetus vinifera rootstock here, and, which surprised me. I thought most of it was the rootstock. So just an example of uh, uh, the box grape, or Vetus labrusca, the Concord grape, you know, that they grow in the east. Uh, anyhow, the other term you're going to hear a lot when you read uh, about you know, making uh, wines is the terroir, or earth. It's basically the effect of the local uh, environment on grape quality. It includes everything like climate and sun and uh, uh, the the effect of the soil, which is probably the most important. And you know, you can have the best conditions, what you think, with lots of nutrients and plenty of water. Actually, that doesn't necessarily make a good grape. In fact, some of the very best grapes in the world are the most stressed in the worst soil. So there's something about the soil that brings out uh, quality of wine, and especially in certain areas like in France and Italy and in Washington for that matter. Now, vineyard quality. Anybody that's floated down the Rhine River uh, on the trip there knows that if they look to the north, that's where most of the grape growing is on these steep slopes coming down the river. 
It's on the north slopes because they uh, face south and where they get more sunshine. You need sun for grapes. You also want good drainage, which drains down the hillside. They like deep roots. The optimal growing is for to have hot days and cool nights like you do on the California coast. Now then you have the harvest and, uh, and uh, getting the grapes and hot weather is better for red. So you want to grow good red uh, grapes, you like them in a hotter climate. That's why most of the red grapes in Europe, but that are famous, are in the lower part of Europe. Whereas the uh, white wines uh, like a cooler weather, so they tend to be further north in uh, Europe than in Germany. You want plenty of sun because photosynthesis increases the sugar. But through the metabolism of photosynthesis, how, uh, you decrease the acid. And you want a nice balance on sugar and acid, and I'll be talking about that in just a little bit. From the start of the grape, it takes about 100 days to grow. Uh, reds take a little longer than whites, but sometimes either one you might leave on the vine longer to get increased sugar, and I'll talk about that in a bit too. Voriacin is on their quiz, by the way, so if anybody's not asleep here, I'll help you out. And that's the color change. And you can look at the picture in the right lower corner where the grapes, if it's a, a white or red, you, you start with a green grape, but then it turns white or starts turning the red to purple. And that picture shows how the grapes, the individual grapes are changing even on the same uh, fruit. When you're growing this, you want to measure the sugar and the acid all the way along after Verizon to see when is the optimal time. You, you want enough sugar so you can get plenty of alcohol uh, uh, synthesized from it, but, and you want enough acid, but the acid is gradually decreasing. If you let it go too low, it, it makes for bad grapes. How do they check that? It, it, they just take the grape juice, and they have uh, acid meters, if you will, and, and they measure the sugar, and I'll talk about that a little bit too. And you don't want the conditions, you don't want too much rain like around harvest time because that dilutes the flavor of the grape. And so there's some minor catastrophes that can happen just with weather changes. Now, as I was saying before the ripening, you increase sugar and you decrease acid. Hot climates have higher sugar and lower acid. So that's a lot of times where the red grapes are. Cool climates have lower sugar and higher acid. Again, for the mostly white wines. You want uh, uh, between 20 and 24 percent sugar for a dry wine. You can divide the amount of sugar, like if it's 24 uh, percent sugar, divide it by two because you get for each uh, sugar molecule you get half as much alcohol. So it, you divide 24 by uh, two and you get 12 percent is basically how much alcohol you can get in it. And if you have, you get to a certain point if you have so much sugar, you produce so much alcohol that uh, the uh, Yeast commits suicide, basically, by producing so much alcohol, it starts to kill them, so it'll stop at a certain point. Now, if you have enough sugar in the wine, uh, uh, you'll, there'll be leftover sugar, because, again, the uh, uh, self-suicide of the yeast. Uh, so, anyhow, if you have more than 24%, usually even higher than that, you can get a sweet wine. If you have less than 20% alcohol, you have increased spoilage, because the uh, uh, alcohol prevents uh, bacterial growth and other things that ruin a wine. Now you measure that by uh, specific gravity and that's using uh, refractometry. And in the early 1800s, two guys, one named Bricks and the other Balling, uh, did uh, make tables for how much sugar and how much you know, light bends in it when uh, refraction, and you could determine how much sugar was in there. And that's actually what they do. They just take it, squeeze the juice, and do you know, Bricks or Balling measurement. We still use those terms. Now, Acid, you don't want too much, because if you have too much, it's tart and sour. On the other hand, too low is much worse. It's flat and you have increased spoilage. There are also non-volatile, well, there, the major acids are non-volatile acids, and the major acids of wine are tartaric and malic acid, and that's measured by titration. I admit I don't do that, but guys in our wine club do that stuff, so they know when's the right time to uh, uh, you know, harvest. You have the volatile acids, which generally you don't want because a lot of them are smelly, and that's just part of the byproducts of some of the yeast. And you don't know exactly what you're going to get because you can get contaminated yeast that make different stuff. You can get contaminated bacteria, and that's much harder to measure. And I don't know, none of my colleagues do that, but in you know Sam and Shell. Now, as I said, the time to harvest when you have the optimal amount of sugar and acid. So you want the sugar about 20. 
the 24 percent or so in there. And the graph on the right of the little the black boxes that are going up show the sugar uh, increasing as the uh, grape is maturing, whereas the blue line shows how the acid decreases. And again, somewhere to, on the right, you want that perfect uh, balance where you want enough sugar but not, not too little acid. Uh, so, and that's, that's the major thing I'm picking. I'll tell you what, uh, uh, there, a lot of the wine uh, uh, makers, the most, some of the most famous ones, basically say, how do you make the decision when you pick the grapes? And what they do is go out and taste them. Just, it's a subtle thing that they can tell. And you want enough tannins in it, and that's determined by tasting the grapes. It adds to the dryness and the fullness, and it also makes wine easier to clarify, and, and clearer wines look better than cloudy ones, although the cloudy one doesn't mean it's bad. And then weather conditions may influence when they pick. So again, the major thing is, when is the sugar and acid just right? Kind of Goldilocks principle. <coughs> Now, you go out to pick the grapes, and this is when the wine maybe starts. Again, you've got the grapes full of sugar and, and, and with falling acid. And what, here's where we take over. We get the grapes are brought over from Prosser, where we get them, and we put them in carboys. And these are five gallon glass containers are called carboys. And again, the uh, process is you take uh, six carbon sugar, you produce two alcohol molecules and carbon dioxide. Now, the carboys are a glass, is, that's what we started. And you have an airlock on the top to let the carbon dioxide out, but you don't want the oxygen to come back down in, because otherwise you'll get vinegar. So this is the carboy sitting there uh, with the airlock on top. Now, it, again, this is winemaking 101. You want to process the grapes quickly. You want to keep cool getting over here as much as you can. That's why a lot of times you're driven over at nighttime because they're sitting in trucks and you want to process them as much as possible. The first thing you do is you crush them to break up the grapes to get the juice to run out and you de stem to get the stems out. Now stems aren't all bad and I was reading that some of the wineries actually like the stems in there because it adds tannin but it makes it a little messier. It's hard if you're using a tubing to get the, tube, the, the fluid to run down the tubing if you have uh, stems in there to get in the way. So the tubing to take it to the press. Now, you don't want to crush the seeds too much because it adds a lot of bitter flavor. This leftover material after you crush the grapes and get rid of the stems uh, is called must. Now the reds, you leave on the skins. You don't go and press them right away. Uh, what you want to do is you want to pick up the red color uh, anthrocyanins uh, in them, uh, and you want to pick up the tannins because red wine, uh, a lot of them are better with more tannins. You add sulfite at this time. Sulfite is a good thing in wine baking because uh, you want to kill the bacteria and kill some of the contaminating yeast. You can have natural yeast in there, and the whole process of making wine, you don't really have to do much. It's all there naturally, but when we make wine, we add the yeast that we want because we're, they're more viable than the natural yeast because some of them produce the byproducts that aren't very good. Now, for whites, you actually press immediately. You add the sulfide right away to kill the bacteria, and then you add the yeast. Now, Willen asked me this a few weeks ago, what about sulfides in food and wine? I probably put a, should have put this in the, after the my next slide. But at any rate, you can look down there and see what the levels. If you go over to about the fourth column from your left, you'll see commercial wines around 100 to 150 parts per million. Uh, uh, SO2. And you can see there are lots of foods with more. I didn't go to check. I didn't know soda had sulfites in it. But packaged meats, soups, French, cut French fries, and look at how high dry fruit. And in the old days, the younger people here don't uh, remember, maybe or maybe they ate salad bars, you had industrial amounts, like 10 times this much. And that's why people had problems with sulfites in them, uh, when they had asthma. Sulfites are natural. They occur in wine without adding. If there are more than 10 parts per million, uh, you have to label contain sulfites. Any questions? Oh, just scratching your nose. Okay. All right. <laughs> I hope it was just scratching. Uh, anyhow, <laughs> but generally, uh, it's less in uh, red than in white wine. You use more in sweet wines just because you got all that sugar and you're worried about contamination. And so you, the maximum in the U.S. is 350 parts per million. In most wines, you have less than 150 parts per million, and this is below the threshold for most people that have uh, sulfite-sensitive asthma. So it's very rare that they would have enough sulfites in, it, in wine to bring out asthma. 
like I said on the previous slide, there's much more in other foods. And trying to look up any evidence that it causes headaches because a lot of people believe that I couldn't find any. Gary, back to the difference between reds and whites. So after you've crushed them, if you leave the skins with the juice, that's the way you make red wine. And if you separate it out immediately and just have the juice fermenting, you get white wine. Uh, you can do that. You know, a red, you can have a red grape and have a pretty white wine, probably a little bit of rosé because you still get some of the pigment off it. If you press the red grapes immediately, it's going to be a very light colored wine. It takes a while to leach out the colors out of the skins. So, and, and, and that ha is done, you know, like Zinfandels, uh, they do that. And you can have a light uh, colored Zinfandel or maybe just a little bit of pink because you can press it right away. So, yes, you can make a... Uh, uh, red wine, pretty white, you press it immediately. You didn't talk about washing your grapes or anything before you press them. Do you wash them or do you just nope. take them from the plant and press them? <laughs> take them from the plant, don't wash them whatsoever. It's got dirt and mud and everything up from the field, bugs. You know, just throw it in there. That's one thing great about alcohol that it, uh, <laughs> that it produces. It is a great uh, 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 destroyer of anything that contaminates it. So. Anyhow, let's see. The pro Here's the interesting thing that I didn't know until I made wine, is that almost all the fermentations in the first two to first uh, one to two weeks, you know, like 90% of the fermentation is very quick and rapid. In fact, at that stage, you uh, we leave the bottles open because it's bubbling over so quickly that if you put a top on it, it would blow it off, okay? And it's, plus it's messy. And so you get the, almost all the alcohol formation in, in the first uh, two to three to three weeks. Uh, and if you got a, a lot of uh, sugar, you can get up to upwards of 15% alcohol. But again, remember I told you that the yeast are killed eventually if they produce too much alcohol. So that's what happened. Now, what you do is, uh, again, the whites you press immediately, the reds you left in the skin for, I'd say on the average, about three weeks, and then we press them. And, and, and you get the what is called the free run, the free juice that first runs off uh, uh, without any pressing. Uh, but then you, you, know, you want to press it just to get more for your buck, more for your buck. And you press it and get some more juice out of it, you can make some more uh, wine. So at any rate, you press it and you, the grape skins at the bottom with some leftover juice is called pomace. And remember that term because I'm going to come back to it and it's on quiz. Now, if people, most of the people that drink wine are, are familiar with malolactate fermentation. Malo means apple and lactic means milk. And literally what happens, and it's down here in the lower corner, it shows how the malic acid goes to lactic acid and produces carbon dioxide. This mellows out a wine. Now, this is uh, important in reds. In whites, you may not want it because you like the tartness. You, you like the apple-like or malic-like flavor, and you may prevent this. Uh, fermentation either by sulfiding hard now to kill the bacteria uh, uh, and that's the easiest way to do it uh, but most of the reds you like to mellow it out uh, again from the uh, so-called malolactate and it's done by lactobacilli this is a bacterial fermentation there are bacteria in those in, in the uh, grape juice so it isn't sterile by any stretch now the other thing I learned is I thought malolactate took place over you know, like years, it doesn't. It, it probably is done by about three months. And uh, now, winemaking continues. Now, you've got the choice to put it in barrels or steel, and what we do is we use glass. We use a carboys for aging. And uh, it depends. Most of the reds are done in, uh, in uh, barrels. Most of the whites are done in uh, steel now, or stainless steel. Except for the Chardonnays are still, if you want oaky flavored Chardonnays, they're still added to oak. Now, the next step is with the juices, like especially the carboys, you rack it. You get all the sediment from the yeast uh, uh, multiplied and divided in and all the uh, uh, stuff settling down, the bacteria, leftover skins that don't, that didn't get pressed off. It um, forms the leaves. And you want to get uh, the, the wine that is clear off the top of the leaves. We just do it by siphon. Just put cider down there. Try not to get it close enough to the bottom to sucks up the debris at the bottom. I don't do any clarification. Clarification means uh, putting something in there to decrease the any flocculated material there, and you can do it by adding bentonite, gelatin, or egg white, which causes the precipitation of the proteins that have them settled at the bottom. 
Now, a, a big one is sometimes do filtering, but that's frowned upon by a lot of purists, saying that the filtering may take away from the quality of the wine. So most, I think, major good wines are not filtered. Uh, you know, your junk wine, that may be different. And then the next step is bottling. Now, why oak barrels and what are oak barrels good in winemaking? Well, first of all, most of us that are home winemakers can't afford French oak because a barrel is about 1,200 bucks. And it's only good for about three years, maybe. I know uh, Rick Johnson has one that's probably 30 years old and obviously has been totally leased out. It really doesn't have much value anymore, but uh, uh, it's, it's just too much to pay 1,200 bucks every three years for a French oak barrel. And American oak isn't that much cheaper. Uh, I cheat a little bit, and I think a lot of home winemakers do it, get wood chips and put uh, uh, French oak chips and put them in the carboys, and, and that's a way to get some exposure to oak. Like I said, the big barrels are generally around 225 liters or 60 gallons. And what imparts the flavor is not only the wood, but toasting of the wood, and that can be light to heavy depending on the uh, preference of the winemaker. Uh, being an oak barrel has less some oxygen in it, and it's felt a little bit as good because it softens the tannins. What do you mean toasting of the wood? Actually, the wood, you know, burn, burn it. Yeah. yeah, burn it. Yeah. So the coopers that make them burn it and then put, put it together. Uh, now, the major thing about the oak is giving it some aromatic compounds that add to the flavor. And it's, uh, a, a lot of our uh, esters and phenolic compounds, like vanillin, which is a Phenolic aldehyde is important. Other phenols, aldehydes, and, and esters, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit. And they impart flavors that include like vanilla and caramel, cream, smoke flavor. Anyhow, all these different flavors by smoking. And I guess you've got to be an expert on barrel to know which ones are going to impart which flavor. I don't know about the chips. I'll have to find out. They, they don't say, tell me. They don't say how much they were toasted or, or, or what the conditions were. Now, you can make wine, but it can turn out bad. There are a bunch of different reasons. One is that it, maybe you've heard the term cork wine, and that's a musty aroma that's like a wet newspaper, and it's due to uh, the accumulation of trichloroanisole. And this is felt to be a metabolite of the fungus on the cork, although you can have this without having the cork. So it, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but it has a bad taste. It won't kill you to drink, and it just, you just won't enjoy the flavor of it. You can oxidize the wine, and it gives it a, a brown color, a nutty flavor, and, and that can be a bad thing, although in Madeira wine, they do it on purpose to give it a nutty flavor. Uh, I hadn't heard this term before, so I don't know. I, I don't doubt that it could happen to some of my wines. It, it, an undesirable flavor is brent, and that's because of a yeast called Britannomyces, produces a barnyard smell. <laughs> you, you can also get the generation of ethyl acetate, which is a sweet smell, and in small amounts, it's okay. But if you get too much of it, it smells like nail polish remover. In fact, ethyl acetate is a nail polish remover. Then there's volatile acidity, and that's primarily acetic acid or vinegar, which is due to bacterial contamination, not from the yeast. And obviously, that's a bad thing if you let it open to the air too much. Now, there are several types of wines. Uh, first of all, there's still wine, which is mainly what I'm addressing here, which is non-sparkling. Sparkling wines, and the most famous one is champagne, where you have carbon dioxide under pressure. And you do this by adding, after the whole process of making your wines, blending your wines, is adding what is called liquor de triage, where you add yeast, in other words, more yeast, wine, and sugar that results in uh, fermentation and resulting increased carbonation. And you can make it dry to sweet. Just a comment, uh, the classic champagne uh, from Champagne region of France is made from three different grapes, either individually or in combination. That's Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, or Pinot Meunier, which is also a red grape like Pinot Noir. So champagnes can be either red, white, or in between. Now, you can also have fortified line, wines, and that's where you add alcohol to an already existing wine. And you do it in the form of brandy. Brandy is distilled wine where you can make higher concentrations of uh, alcohol. In it. And the classic two that are famous are port, and that's uh, where they add the brandy before the complete fermentation, and sherry, which is brandy ap added after the fermentation. And you may have uh, read Shakespearean plays, and they drink sack all the time, and sherry is sack. 
Now, uh, some more uh, Tides wines is aromatized or flavored and fortified wines. And it was originally done to resurrect a bad wine that had bad taste. So uh, let's cover it up with something. And the, and the most famous probably from both, but also Madeira, Port, and Sherry are fortified and can be flavored. And here's some of the flavors like high sop, which is a, a blue flower that tastes like mint, and coriander. Uh, uh, what is that? Cilantro. Is coriander the same as cilantro? It's a yeah. It is, anyhow. So it's a cilantro like taste. A one that you come across is wormwood. Now, the uh, uh, vermouth, the word vermouth is German for wormwood because they used wormwood to extract it to give it the flavor, this aromatic sized flavor. And it's an anise flavor, and it's from, uh, and you can make a distilled spirit from wormwood called absinthe. Now, for years, it was thought that it was a hallucinogen. It was felt that maybe that it uh, had uh, contributed to the craziness of Van Gogh and Toulouse-Lautrec. Toulouse-Lautrec used to carry it around in a cane, so he always had it with him, and then he'd pop, open his cane, and drink his absinthe. It's well, a famous painting called The Absinthe Drinker. Drinker. And, and yeah, and, and they usually appear with no expression on their face, and, like their minds are dead. Uh, there's no question, I think these guys drank a lot of it, but I don't think it was hallucinogen, and, and actually, in, in 2007, absent, uh, after 100 years of being illegal in the United States because they thought it was a hallucinogen, uh, it's legalized. And the absence calls the Green Fairy. And this is, there is a uh, company that has absinthe. They, they call it the Green Fairy. There's a picture of it. And that's what they called it back in the 1800s when Van Gogh was drinking it, too. I went to a talk with the guy who helped get it legalized. His name was Ted Bro. And they say that the reason why we have that kind of negative connotation of absinthe was that the French soldiers were given absinthe when they came back from the wars. They didn't want to drink wine anymore. And the wine industry went to, was losing tons and tons of money. So they decided to basically make this negative campaign against absinthe and say that's awful, terrible, will cause you to lose your mind, psychedelic, all these processes. It basically led to the worldwide ban of this drink, which led to the wine industry. Story. How come I didn't find it? That makes a lot of sense. Uh, but like I said, it obviously influenced us till 2007 here. Now i got to go out and try some absinthe. <laughs> anyhow, a little bit of history of port, and, and, and some of this might actually be apocryphal. But anyhow, England and France were always at war, you know, 100 years war, 30 years war, every one of those wars. And of course, France had the wine and England couldn't grow. So they wanted wine when they were at war with them. So they got it from Portugal, when they get it from Porto, which is a city on the coast of Portugal. And uh, they get the wine from there, and by the time we got it, it was usually spoiled. So what happened is they added brandy to it, and brandy, you could put more alcohol in it, more likely to last longer. And uh, so that uh, solved the problem, and that's where the name Port came from, which was named after the city where they were getting the uh, embellished uh, wine. Now, this is on the uh, uh, comments about the aging of the wines. <laughs> Generally, most wines don't age well and should be consumed within a year or two. Only 1% of wines should be aged 5 to 10 years. Kind of like Frank buys. Uh, those with more acid, tannins, and those that are sulfided more are more likely to age. You know, people say, oh, I don't want any sulfites in my wine. You're not going to age your wines if you, unless you put it in there uh, in all likelihood. They aren't going to be very good. The more full-bodied or acidic breads, including Cabernet Sauvignon, Syrah, Nebbiola. A Pinot Noir is kind of an exception, but it can age well. And Sangiovese, and again, brandy and fortified wines last longer. I would just have a sign here, a picture of uh, 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 the aging of a uh, winer. And there's one and here. She was with uh, Lexi, at, and she was premature six weeks, so she's a tiny little thing, about five pounds. You can see she's more robust and full-bodied at three months of age, and by one year of age, she's a beautiful, um, biased, uh, mature wine. And by the way, she's not really wine. Or wine. I'm playing on So, Gary, when you see people going to these exclusive auctions and buying wines that are hundreds, hundreds of years old and spending tens of thousands, they have no idea what they're getting. And I would assume they're getting spoiled stuff. I think they've had too much absinthe. <laughs> I think it's pretty crazy, but there are people into this, and collectors, and they go pretty crazy, and they're willing to pay 2000 bucks for a bottle of wine. The crazy thing, once you drink it, it's gone anyway. 
and doing good. I, and I, I'm biased in fact, after 10, 15 years, even a good wine, I think you're taking a risk by going any further than that. And I think it's crazy, but these guys obviously have money to spend. And I think that's the major reason. And they can flaunt it. It's kind of a status symbol. And I got this $2,000 bottle of wine that Thomas Jefferson drank. And of course, it's not <laughs> good anymore. So, Frank, you have any comments on aging? Yeah, well, no, I mean, it sort of depends what you like. I mean, uh, it was a revelation to me. I, I actually met this guy who makes Riesling in Ger Germany, and he said that, you know, San Michel's to blame for us thinking good Riesling is like two years old. But he has like 15, 18 year old Riesling that he brought out, and it's, I mean, it's a totally different taste. So I think the same is true for, you know, 20 or 30 year old Cabernet. It's what you like. You know. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, the esters and it, it may change. I think it's usually softened, and I have to right. admit, I like a robust, full-bodied red. red. Yeah. So, it's just, so it all depends on what you like. Yeah. So they continue to age even in a glass bottle. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, well, they do change. The flavors change over time, and, and you know they always talk about a, a good full-bodied red is too young to drink. Okay. Uh, I think, you know, this is my bias. I think a good full body red should be drunk in five to ten years. I, 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 I think you're pressing it. And I had a Leonetti that I saved for about 15 years drank and was crummy. You know, and, and Leonetti's a good great. Yeah. Anyhow, I think Lamb would agree with me on this one that aging is overrated. <laughs> oh, oh, Gary, on this, yes. a lot of the wine bars are serve, they're keeping their stock under Argon. What does is that? They were, which one well, would well, obviously, argon prevents uh, getting oxygenated, and, you know, that oxygen is the enemy. And, uh, you know, they even in a cork uh, bottle, uh, some of oxygen gets in there. And, and if you look at the bottles over time, the, you know, you'll have the uh, wine this close to the top of the cork. Five years later, it's about this far. You go 10, it's about this far. The real purists uncork either put nitrogen or put more uh, wine in it to prevent it. That's the other way is to put an argon. I guess the people that are very wealthy use argon. Do you use argon? <laughs> uh, uh, so I, it's to prevent the oxygen, I'm sure. Okay. Anyhow, I, I talked about pomace. Uh, oh, first of all, distilled wines. Brandy, I already talked about it. Uh, again, a distilled wine, you make brand, and you can get up to 60% alcohol. You can take the pomace, you know, the pressed skins at the bottom. You can also distill that and drink it. Uh, some people say it's pretty good. It, it, it seems to me like it's the dregs of winemaking, but it's called Marc in France and Grappa in Italy. And if you're really poor and you got no money, but you want to get a little wine, you can take and make a weak wine from the pomace by just pouring water over and taking the drain and out, because there is some alcohol in the pomace. And that, you know, during the Revolutionary Wars and a lot of the poor people, that's what they drank. Now, there are natural sweet wines, and I think i got to get hustling here a little bit. And, and there are some grapes that just concentrate a lot of sugar and have 30%. And if you have too much sugar, the yeast can't convert it all. And some of the high sugar grapes, for example, are Muscat, Grenache, and Mission. A lot of these are jug wines. Now, there, you can also make a, a natural sweet wine by, sweet wine by overripening the grapes or leaving on the vine a long time. Remember I told you sugar just keeps going up with the sunlight, all the acid goes down. Hotter the drier the climate, the longer you can leave it on the vine to get more sugar. The other thing you can do is just leave it on until the first uh, freeze. And that's called ice wine, probably most of you are familiar with it. And that's always a sweet dessert wine and they just leave it on so long. There's a lot of risk in leaving it on the vine that long because a lot of times it starts rotting before you get that far. So the grape juice also, well, it resonates the uh, juice uh, and freezes out. So you need way more grapes to make an equivalent amount of wine. And that's one, another reason why it's very expensive. But you can make a sweet wine that way. You can evaporate it. In other words, same thing, kind of resonate it. it decrease the uh, water in the uh, grapes, concentrating the sugar. And that's what they do with Amarone, which is from Veneto, Italy area. They dry their red grapes. I guess it could be white or a mix. Uh, on uh, for months to dehydrate them, and then that concentrates the sugar, and they make a sweet wine. What I do to make it, if I want to make a little bit of a sweet wine, I'll do that with my whites, as I taste it it's after the fermentation. And you know, and when I feel like I just got enough sugar to make it fruity, but not to taste sweet, hit it hard with sulfites, and you can stop the uh, the fermentation and you stop stop it with extra sugar there. Uh, 
Then there's the term noble rot, which is caused by uh, a mold botrytis scenario. And this is, uh, it seemed like it was bad, but it, it gives an enhanced flavored type of wine. It's especially used, uh, found on Semillon and Rieslings. And again, and in some ways it raisinates because it dehydrates. This concentrates the sugar. And actually you get fermentation inside the grape before it's pressed. And so it, it produces a uniquely honey flavored white wine. I have to admit, I've never tried it. Uh, it can be very expensive. The most famous ones are the Sauternes and Toke wine. Now, as far as the different uh, types, there are over 10,000 types of grapes. And one, at one place said 1,368 varieties used in commercial winemaking. The reality is it's way too complicated to memorize the grapes. But if you know about 10 to 15 of the uh, reds, about 8 to 10 major whites, you'll have uh, a pretty good background and be able to answer most of the questions on Jeopardy about winemaking. <laughs> now, red wines, this is my own list, because uh, and people might disagree with it, about light to full body. Pinot Noir is very light. It's uh, uh, more sophisticated. It isn't robust like the stronger ones below. Gamay are light and sweet, are, are often Tempranillo uh, and uh, a Spanish uh, red. Sangiovese, I'm going down the list stronger and stronger. Merlot, Zinfandel, you get the full body like Syrah. Cabernet Sauvignon, Tabiola. And, and that same list is not only from light to full body, and generally the higher tannins, the deeper color, and more likely to age as well as you go down the list. But there are exceptions because Pinot Noirs can age. Now, I threw this slide in here to show you that a lot of the flavors are esters in wines that are metabolites uh, of the uh, yeast or, or from other sources, even the uh, wood of the barrels. And on the uh, horizontal scale are the uh, uh, alcohol part of the ester and on the vertical scales or the carboxylic acid part. Remember, it's a, you condensate an alcohol and a carboxylic acid to get an ester. And you can see all these flavors, and you hear about the terms artificial flavors. They're just these uh, esters, and you go down here, I want apple flavor, I'll have a three-carb propanoin and a butyl uh, molecule now with apple flavor. These are the same kind of flavor that come out of the wines. I'm not sure all of these, of the hundred or so here, are in wines, but many of them are, and they're natural produced. So you can get a lot of different flavors. Red wine varieties, you have Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, which is from the Bordeaux region. The, the more full-bodied the wine, the more it's like dark uh, uh, berries, like you know, black cherries and currants, and the lighter, more like strawberries and raspberries. If you know, trying to be sophisticated, you're saying, oh, drink this Pinot Noir, you just have an educated guess. Usually the Pinot Noir is like a light colored berry, and whereas the Cabernet is like a dark colored one. But anyway, Pinot Noirs are from the Burgundy region and are berry flavored. Merlot is a Bordeaux wine. It's less acid, it has uh, less tannins than Cab, and it tends to be more perfumey. Cabernet Franc, which is used in uh, Bordeaux blends, uh, again, it's berry and currants. And Syrah, uh, in Australia, it's called, called Shiraz, but it's the same stuff which is from the Rhone Valley of France, as is classically described as the herbs and violets, but I think it's a full-bodied red. I didn't even, I never thought about where Petite Syrah came from, but it has its own grape. It's called the Durand grape. Never heard of that before. More red wines of a, a 10 or 12, you should know. Grenache is from Rhone, and it's a raspberry flavored, lighter grape. Gamay, which is using Beaujolais, which is light cherry, strawberry. Tempranillo is a cherry flavored one from Spain. I like Nebbiola. Nebbiola is very expensive. Uh, one of the ultimate wines to get. It tastes like tar and leather and truffles. <laughs> so one picture of them. There, Sangiovese is a lighter Tuscany wine, soft cherry, but it can be very full bodied too. So, th you know, this is a range. And then Zinfandel, which is a, felt it was felt to be a, uh, a uniquely California wine because they couldn't find out where in Europe it came from. And they said, you've got the Zinfandel grape in California, but all those grapes had to come from uh, Europe or someplace else. But just recently, they, by DNA analysis, they were able to find out that actually the berry is the same as the Primitivo grape from Italy and Croatia. So it is a, a, mostly a California wine, though. But you can grow in Washington, by the way. 
Uh, anyhow, major white wines, and this is my separation. Uh, Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Gris often are usually dry wines, uh, light, uh, but often dry. Chenin Blancs and Semillon. Riesling can be a, as dry as you want to, but a lot of times it's sweet, as is Muscat, worth the worst demeanor. And I think uh, the richest white wines are the Chardonnays and the Viognier, the Viognier from the Rome region of France. And I already talked about sparkling, so I can skip that. Minutes. Chardonnay is northern France, a cool weather white grape, and it tastes like apples and, or pears. And the next time you drink Chardonnay, it tastes like apples and pears. Sauvignon Blanc, grassy steel. You say, well, what does grassy steely taste like? Have a Sauvignon Blanc, and you'll see what I mean. It's, it's tart, and, and it, it has a grassy flavor. And Riesling is classically uh, peaches and pears, and it's a northern European white, so Germany and the Alsace region of France. And the semillon, which is down Bordeaux, of the, the full-bodied bread, which is peaches and apricots. Now, just a very brief summary of the world-famous regions, and I'm getting close to the end here. You know, France and Italy are, are probably the two most famous places in, in the world. And again, you can kind of uh, divide France in half, in the northern half with the Loire and the Champagne, and at least the northern Burgundy and Alsace is mostly white grapes. Okay, whereas the southern part is mostly red grapes, but there is overlap. <coughs> Champagne, again, in northern France, and they grow Chardonnays and Pinot Noirs, the cool weather grapes, and they make Champagne. The Bordeaux region is the southwest uh, region, and it's uh, famous for the blended, full bodied reds, and 80% of the uh, grapes are red down there. If you get a wine and it says Chateau La Vite de Rothschild or any other chateau, you, if from France, you know it's from the Bordeaux region because that's what they call the wine grapes. Red grapes used, the five classics are Cabernet, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Cabernet Franc, Malbec, and Petit Bordeaux, and often all five are made in Bordeaux, using Bordeaux blends, whereas the white grapes are Chenin Blanc, Semillon, and again, Sauternes, uh, some of the major world famous ones, those ones from Noble Rod I was talking about, are from this area as well, but they're, they're grown from other regions. This is just an example that shows the five grapes and most Bordeaux, and they have the white Bordeaux, which is mostly Semillon and Sauvignon Blanc. So if you have white Bordeaux wine, you probably got those grapes. Now the Burgundy region is the other very famous area of France, and uh, the northern part uh, is uh, famous for, uh, well, basically two major grapes. One is Pinot Noir is their red grape, and Chardonnay is their white. In this case, their vineyards are called Domaine, so when the labels say Domaine de Rothschild or whatever, and says, so you know it's from the Burgundy region if it has Domaine on it. Now, Chablis, and you've heard of Chablis, they're all Chardonnays. I kind of pointed out the Cote d'Or only because it's probably the most famous place for the best Chardonnays and the best Pinot Noirs, uh, which is listed there at the site. One unique thing they have in the southern part of, uh, of, of the area of Burgundy is they have the Beaujolais region. And there, almost all the uh, grapes are a red grape called the Gamay grape. And this is where they make the Beaujolais wine. And the technique is different here. They do what is called carbonic maceration. Instead of pressing the grape, they let the grapes all ferment in barrels, if you will, or in, in, in a container. Uh, leaving the grapes intact and letting them ferment within the grape, putting carbon dioxide over it to prevent oxygen coming in, and, and actually bottling it just in a few weeks. So you get a, a nice, light, fruity uh, red wine with low tannins, and you can make it very quickly. It's usually a cheap wine. It's, it's not one to age, but it's very famous. And again, you get the Beaujolais from this carbonic maceration. The Rhone region is famous for Syrahs, and Syrahs are great grapes. The northern part of this, uh, you see the picture, is where they grow Syrah. The southern part is of Grenache, but they have lots of other varieties. What I like is my favorite white wine from the region is Viognier, which is very good from the state of Washington, too. You know, when you hear, you, you've heard of Chateau de Pop, or the new house of the Pope. They really do blend all these grapes, so it's often very expensive because they're all blended. Now, just quickly to finish up, and then we'll get to our quiz here. The Loire Valley has uh, uh, white wines primarily, Chenin Blanc and Sauvignon Blanc, but they also grow Pinot Noir. And you've probably seen labels Pouli Fumi and Sancerre. 
here they named the, uh, the wines after the region, so you don't really know what grapes are in there. But it turns out that those two brands are Sauvignon Blanc, whereas Bouvre is Chenin Blanc. But you just have to know that. Uh, they, they don't put it on the label. The rest of France is, is not all that well known. Uh, Provence and Languedoc and Salona, the biggest producers of grapes, but they're all cheaper, less quality grapes. Gary, um, you mentioned DNA analysis. Do all these things go back to one root plant? I mean, what, what was the original grape? What, what well, they're all used to the But and, and I, my guess is like, dogs and cats, you know, they all went back to the wolf, and they're probably the one feed is vinifera, but then they modify them by things like terroir and the way you harvest them, etc. But I really don't know the answer to your question. Finish up with Italy, and then uh, we'll move on to the quiz. The Tuscan red wines, and there's Tuscany, of course, uh, uh, that is uh, north of Rome. Uh, Sangiovese and Montepulciano. Did I say that right? Montepulciano. Thank you. Are the major <laughs> red grapes. When you hear of a Chianti, uh, that is almost always Sangiovese. It may have some other grapes, and it usually has a black rooster on the label, which it has had for the last 700 years. Brunello uh, is also a Sangiovese, but famous. You've heard that name before. A big thing now is they make blending the uh, Sangiovese with other reds, and they're called Super Tuscans. Those are from that region. I think the Piedmont region probably has the, the finest uh, wines. Like, uh, those are the ones that are derived from Nebbiola. Uh, it's like Barola and Barbaresco. They do have some other grapes that are famous and not as expensive, like Dolcetto grape, which is a more fruity and flavorful, and Barbera, which is a high acid grape with low tannins as well. And the Benito area, or by Venice, uh, there, you, you go to the uh, wine store and have, you see Balpot Le Cialda. And it's a red uh, blend from grapes that I've never even heard of from there. Amarone, you remember that's one they dry on uh, straw mats using the same grapes they use in Balpot Cialda. And lastly, uh, you know, when you go over to uh, uh, Venice, everybody's drinking Prosecco and you're drinking Prosecco walking down the street. I never knew, it's a sparkling wine, but I never knew it was from Galera grapes. Is it made like champagne? Uh, you get it to sparkle. It is, yeah, same thing. So they do add uh, yeast and sugar at the end. Now, this is the time to go to the quiz. Variacin. What's that? It's green. 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 Malolactate fermentation, best match. Lactobacilla. Lactobacilla. Very good. The TCA, trichloroamisol. Or one. Wormwood. Carbonic maceration. Beaujolais. Beaujolais, that's right. But try this scenario. Right. Very good. Prosecco, the last set. Clara. 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 Hey. That, that, that's a new one. And Phyloxera Bacitrix. Laos. Oh, Laos. Laos. It's a Laos. And the regions, Tempranillo, where's that? I didn't get a chance. Sangiovese is what part of... Uh, Tuscany. Tuscany, okay. Yeah. Italy. Okay, Gamay grapes are from what region? South. West. Burgundy, yeah, South Burgundy. Yeah, you don't. You think about Pinot Noirs and Chardonnays, you don't think about yeah, maybe that. And Riesling is from close to Germany. Uh, you know, actually, uh, Saint Michel is the biggest producer of Riesling wines, I think, in the world. Mm. Amarone is from where? Benito. Nebbiola is from uh, Piedmont. Piedmont. Zinfandel is from California. Malbec is from. And Syrah is from Australia. <laughs> well, it would be Syrah, but no, Syrah is from. Okay, now after doing this uh, talk about the health benefits of the wine, I thought for next year my topic for next year will be the health benefits. Just one comment for the fellows: if you wondered why you listened to this talk, what this had to do with anything. Uh, <laughs> Other than the beginning, where Gary I got serious, uh, got serious, and did some health issues, it's been a long-standing tradition for me to give Gary a topic that has nothing to do with allergy for sure, medicine usually. So he's done uh, 
English literature. <laughs> he's done tectonic, tectonic plates. plates. He's yeah. done uh, Big Bang. Uh, Big Bang. Star Gold. Big Bang. Big Bang. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So, Gary, I have two questions. What are they doing with the shortage of courts? And number one. And number two, what is the, do the aerators that they sell now, do they make any difference in what you do? You know what? Uh, people swear by them, and, and, and I think it does probably make a difference. I have to admit I don't do it. The other thing is just to open it early, put it in the harass. Yeah, and, and, and sometimes, you know, my wife sometimes is better the next day. You know, so that's, that's true. And, and you the said the cork. The cork shortage. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, they're starting to use more synthetic cork. Corks are maybe not as magic as they talk. You know, it's, there is tradition. It just doesn't seem like you have to do it. But I, it, I think that may uh, go by the wayside here in the future, just because they are expensive. A good cork is like a buck a piece. Yeah. Yeah, so the bottles that they screw on the caps. I mean, if you make an airtight seal, does that make any difference? Yeah. You know, for cheaper ones, I don't know. You know, it's a good question. If a bottle's going to age five to ten years, I don't, I don't know that anybody's doing that. But for a, a few years, I think it's great. Okay. Yeah, it's yeah, it's much easier. Thanks, Gary. That was good. All right. Stuck with uh, Europe mostly, but yeah, you know, I didn't know you were going to talk to Europe. Yeah, right. Well, kind of, I, you know, I didn't have a little bit on uh, Washington, Oregon, or California. California. You know, you got to see about we can grow almost every grape. You know, in Europe, you know, they're famous for their grape farms. We can grow every one of those, except Washington, which is Pinot Noir. Oregon is mostly cool weather white grapes on the coast, or, or, or cool weather red. So, so Oregon is mostly like the California coast is not everything. Yeah. But, 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 but the interesting is the, uh, the full body kind of wine.